Well, I'm pleased to say that I've been joined by three experts in impact sourcing, uh, a very interesting topic, which we're going to explore in a minute. So joining me in the downtown den today is Tracy Freeman, all the way from uh, South Africa. We've got John uh, Yarlett, who's uh, in London or just outside London in Essex, I think I'm right in saying. And we've got Mauricio Valquez from Colombia as well. But Tracy, just tell us a bit about yourself and your background and what you've been working on at the moment. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Simon, and thanks for having me. So um, I've been involved in the social space through the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, they looked at running the Digital Jobs Africa project, and one of the countries that they looked at was South Africa. So um, I helped support them from a South African perspective. Um, and we'll chat about it in a little bit more detail now. But my other hat is working in the global business services space. So looking at BPO, offshoring, et cetera, and those two worlds happen to collide really, really well. And um, so that's really where I'm focused. That's great, that's a great introduction. John, t tell, us, uh, tell us more about intelligent sourcing and, and what, you do, what you've been doing. Thank you, Simon, and, and thanks for having me. Um, so intelligent sourcing is a multimedia platform predominantly for end users in the sourcing space. So we, we cover the whole area of sourcing from ITO to BPO to shared services um, and we do a lot um, around impact sourcing um, through Bepeza and Tracy through the work we do uh, with the Global Impact Sourcing Coalition and through the work we do as well with the International Association of Outsourcing Professionals um, and a lot of their CSR stuff so as you said it's a really interesting topic and looking forward to speaking about it. Excellent, great. Mauricio, t tell us a bit about yourself over there in Colombia. Simon, thank you for inviting me to this uh, important conversation. Basically, I'm based out of Bogota, Colombia, and uh, as Tracy and John said, we have many things in common. I am, I as well as invited by Rockefeller Foundation to be part of this uh, initiative a long time ago, and I am part of AIOP as well. So. Everything fits, fits into what uh, what we're going to talk about it today. Excellent. And let me start by saying many of the people that watch this on social media and through downtown probably don't know what impact sourcing is, and I didn't know until about six months ago. John, do you want to give us sort of a definition and explanation of what's meant by impact sourcing? And I'll ask the others to come in as well. Yeah, certainly. Um, I think before I give you, I guess, my my two areas of definition, if you like, um, off the bat, I just want to make sure that people understand that what impact sourcing, sourcing isn't, it's not charity. So just to be clear on that, there are a lot of charitable kind of uh, initiatives and, and things like that across the industry. Impact sourcing isn't one of them. What impact sourcing is, is giving people an opportunity that may not otherwise have that opportunity but also creating new revenue streams um, within that community. So it's, it's bigger really than just putting someone in employment or giving someone that opportunity. When you um, give someone the opportunity, you're not just affecting them, you're affecting them, their family, their town, the community, and so on. So it's a real ripple effect. Um, it's also not something that um, is just you know, relevant to countries, typical countries where you think it might be relevant. You know, it's a global oh. um, initiative. There are pockets of countries all over the world. You know, if you look at somewhere like Scotland, where you've, people may think of places like Edinburgh and Glasgow and Aberdeen as hubs, but there's also places in the Highlands and Islands that, you know, are, are harder to get to, or there's not that much opportunity there. And, you know, impact sourcing come into, comes into play there. Same in the US with um, natural disasters like Katrina, you know, those areas now benefit from impact sourcing. So that's kind of my definition and a, a few examples there. Great stuff, thanks. Absolutely. Tracy, do you want to add to that? Because it's about commissioning services, isn't it, from a different place? But you say more, you'll explain it better than me. Absolutely. So I would define um, exactly to what John was saying, and, and I like the fact that he started off by saying it's not charity, because it certainly isn't. Um, it is intentional hiring of marginalised individuals. And um, what John mentioned makes it is 100% spot on. Your marginalised individual in different countries looks different. 
So we know that in Egypt, for example, your female is highly marginalized. So that would be a focus area for them. In South Africa, our unemployed black youth are very, very marginalized. So that's the focus area in South Africa. Um, to the US, again, your um, military spouses that are moved around all the time and are only going to be in an area for a period of two years, often the spouse won't get employed because of that. So those would all qualify as marginalized individuals. But the idea is really to reach out into the community and give individuals that otherwise would not have had an opportunity or a chance to get into the world of work because of the way that we recruit and actually throw out the book on how we recruit based on previous experience, et cetera, and actually recruit for, um, um, for attitude to get the right individual in rather than um, a report card or a schooling card um, that they've got and making sure that they had the marks that you think that they need. And time and time again, it's actually been proven that the individuals who come into the environments, if given the opportunity, are outperforming the standard recruit. Uh, many reasons for it. A, they've been given the opportunity, but B, there's the loyalty factor that someone's actually given them a chance. Um, and that in the BPO sector or many of your retail sectors, tourism, hospitality, the attrition rates are a lot lower, uh, the performance is a lot higher. So we've seen huge amounts of success. And that's where the commercial opportunity actually comes in by bringing these individuals into the organization. Uh, and, and let me turn to Mauricio. There is a strong, that's a good point, Tracy, that there is a strong commercial dimension to this, isn't there? It's people outsourcing services to, to a call center or wherever else. Uh, and, and it's a commercial exchange in many respects. That's been applied uh, in, Col in Colombia. The two examples that you gave me previously, Mauricio, did you want to tell us a little bit about those? Yeah, and, and complementing what John and Tracy, and I think the important portion here is to emphasize, this is not charity. They are doing work from day one, which is concrete, solid, and productive. And based on experience, and I think Tracy and I have been on, on the market for many years doing this type of things. Most of the times, these girls and, and people do better than the standard, I would say, quote unquote, normal people. And when I mean normal people, it's people that have been having work for many years, many, many times. The other important portion, uh, Simon, is that when you get connected to it, and when these people get connected to it, they love it. They love it. Attrition levels are low. Results are, in, in, I would say, amazing. And the other thing is they grow. They grow, the families grow, and the community grow, which is, I think, the important portion that I have seen on the projects that I've done here in Colombia. And, 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 and the important portion, again, is don't give us money. Give us the opportunity of these resources, develop and construct solutions for them, for the community. And just to open a comment here is, this is an important moment in our lives, and I would say worldwide, because COVID came and is gonna stay for a long time. So if we give these people the opportunity of being someone, they are gonna do it. And we have cases. All of us that are here have seen those cases and are amazing cases. Very good. Now, just tell, I'll stay with you, Mauricio, just for a moment. Tell us a little bit about the two projects uh, that you outlined to me, because they seem to have a strong impact as well in two particular areas in Colombia. Yeah. And, 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 and basically, Simon, uh, the two projects that I've done and that I work with and, and help companies uh, construct base, basically started as a need for providing a decent job to youth uh, people, right? Which I, as Tracy said, I would say that South Africa and Colombia probably are far away, but have some commonalities. And these are the type of things that we find when we go and, and try to push these projects. One was, a, it's, it's, it's a city that had long time problems in terms of violence. And the other one is a small city in the middle of the Colombian coffee grower mountains, you know, where the coffee comes from. And these two cities became very interesting because the, the interest started from families that had long time relationship with those two cities, you know, and they have two foundations. 
And these ONGs, if we can call it that way, contacted me and we started building the process. And, and the process is very easy, you know. And as I told you before, and, and Tracy and, and John have seen it with, when we talked about it, is we get offer and demand. And offer and demand in terms of what you can offer as a small city or as a small town, as, or as John said, and on those cities probably, or, or regions in Scotland or the UK or wherever in the world, and what, the, what a, a, a provider can provide. But the important portion here is to get the connection with the customer that needs the service to be provided. And again, there's no need to have money on the equation. Money will come as part of the evolution of work. So that's basically what we did. And we started with 25 people, 25 good Colombian youth people, young people that needed to have a work. Most of them, their first work, and right now we have 640 people, 640 people. So we changed from 25 to 640. That's one example. And the other one to give you an idea, there's no way to get to that town by plane. We have to drive four hours and a half from the nearest, I would say, uh, city located to them. We started with 22 people. And right now, actually, up to date, 71 good Colombian boys are developing work for a very important uh, financial institution here. So it's doable, it can be worked out. And again, I won't stop, you know, there's no need for money, money will come, money will appear. And good hearts and good people get connected and that's the way that we're doing it. Excellent. And Tracy, before I come to John for some, perhaps some UK examples as well, because that's what you touched upon. But Tracy, uh, I, I was out in South Africa uh, late last year, saw the Harambe uh, project, absolutely phenomenal. But will you tell us a bit about that and how, how, and how that has an effect? So we've got a number of organizations in South Africa that are really focused in on impact sourcing and they've all got phenomenal success stories. Um, and when Rockefeller Foundation originally sort of came into South Africa as one of the source countries to look at the Digital Jobs Africa project, there were a number of organizations that put their hands up and said, we're practicing this engagement of digital skills for youth, which is really what it was about. Um, and impact sourcing was sort of born out of that. So one of the organizations is uh, Career Box that services a BPO in South Africa called CCI. Um, there's a, num a number of others, but Harambi had really been very intentional about what it is that they were doing. Um, they weren't only focused on BPO, it just so happened that the BPO sector really seemed to put up their hand um, and have an appetite for taking on um, youth that hadn't previously worked in the environment. Um, the Haram story is a really, it's a phenomenal success story where they started off, I think I stand to correction, but sort of eight clients and they're sitting in the hundreds now. Um, and it's really, they just keep turning um, recruitment on its head, if you want to call it that. Uh, even if it looks like it's working, they'll go back and say, hang on, let's see how we can actually, you know, improve this. But it's really about digging as deep as possible into communities and reaching out to, in the South African version, youth that otherwise would not have been accessed. Um, so they literally go out, they've got feet on the street where they go and, and um, let the youth know that there is this opportunity, there's no charge for them to register on a, a free to use Mobi platform. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's not about what are your school marks, your school leaving marks that doesn't get you access. It's more your attitude that gets you access initially. Um, but they start right from the very beginning where a lot of the youth don't even have an email address. They, wouldn't, they haven't set one up. So helping them get up, um, you know, with an email address. Uh, they have some very funky online tools that tests ability um, and aptitude versus, again, your school report. Um, and often that's been a struggle. Just the fact that these individuals have managed to actually complete school, considering the environment they come from and the miles that they have to walk to get to school on a daily basis, et cetera, et cetera that in itself shows a certain amount of grip and resilience, which is actually what organizations are looking to employ. So again, they've reached out far and wide across sectors saying, which sectors are the ones that have the appetite to take on previously disadvantaged individuals or marginalized individuals that haven't had experience in that environment, but they show the right aptitude and attitude to be able to, to, to actually work in that environment. And as Mauricio said, um, a lot of these organizations are very much service-based, hence the, the BPO or the GBS sector being um, so big on actually taking on the youth. 
So much so that we've seen relationships with the likes of a career box or a Harambee. Um, Harambee with web help is a great example where um, I stand to correction, but it's something like 50% of their staff actually come through the impact sourcing model. Um, and they're finding phenomenal success and their clients are thrilled with the results that they're showing for their customers. Um, so yeah, so that, that would be one of the examples, but it, it's absolutely heartwarming going into the environment and just seeing the hunger um, from the youth that have come in and just the, the gratefulness of having an opportunity to work where our unemployment rate is so horrendously high in South Africa and just really willing to go the extra mile, which is really what it's about. And being open to learning, having an, an appetite for learning and just, again, the success stories that we've seen and impact sourcing, I think what's important, you don't start at an entry level job and stay there. The whole idea is how do we grow the individual to grow their career within whatever environment they go into. And as we well know, a lot of our service environments, specifically your call center BPO environment, the skills and the knowledge that you pick up there are massively transferable to any other sector. Um, because of what it is that you have to learn going into a BPO environment. So we've seen wonderful success stories of individuals coming in, starting out as an agent, growing up quickly to team leaders, to trainers, to quality assessors, workforce managers, and all the way up to leadership, uh, senior leadership positions. So it, it's a phenomenal success story, and it's really just allowing us to access communities that we otherwise have closed ourselves off from. So a lot of countries sit there going, oh, we need skills, we haven't got skills, but actually we're just not looking in the right places. And impact sourcing allows us to do that. Really good, that's a really good perspective, Tracy. John, you've got a great overview of the industry, haven't you, with, with the publication and uh, platform that you uh, mm -hmm. provide. Any examples that you want to focus in on there and give us an example of? Um, not so much examples, but I think the other important thing to remember is that you know we're talking today about impact sourcing because that's I guess you know the, uh, the heading if you like that that most people in the industry would see this as. Um, there are great things happening around the world you know we can talk about great things happening in the UK but they may not be under the umbrella of the phrase impact sourcing. So like what they're doing in you know Colombia and South Africa and all over the world um, there are initiatives happening. Um, but if you're, you know, if you kind of, I guess, went to Google and searched impact sourcing examples in the UK, you know, you may not find a lot of things, but there are pockets of the country, you know, whether it's being done by the employment service or whether it's being done by, you know, extracurricular activities that are taking, you know, not just use, but, you know, they're taking use that may not be given the opportunity. Um, uh, ex-forces leavers that have left the forces now and have got the most amazing skill set um, that are ready to go back into employment, um, single mothers and fathers, so all of these kind of small groups of people. Um, and, and it goes back to what the other guys were saying, you know, we're not just talking about, um, you know, putting people in employment because, you know, we can talk all day about the, the success of the youth and how hungry they are and how motivated they are. But ultimately, if the potential employer doesn't see that or have experience of that, no one's gonna get a job, right? So no one's gonna get in, uh, in employment. So when Tracy speaks about examples, you know, of web help, and there are examples of, you know, people like uh, Microsoft and Facebook and other massive companies doing this, they're not doing it because it ticks the CSR box. They're doing it because genuinely the level of labor coming through these chains and coming through these kind of streams whether it's impact sourcing or whatever you want to call it it's of such a high quality because these people are hungry to work and that's why they invest in it you know that, that's really why because their facts and figures and, and whatever they have how they measure these people you know i've, I've been in South Africa with Tracy as you were last year and you know the, the figures don't lie Simon you know you can put the figures down and have a look at them and you will see you know 10 out of 10 times these guys come out on top. Yeah yeah re re really impressive and these are blue chip companies that are commissioning services you Mauricio mentioned financial institutions uh, the companies that are offshore into to Colombia and uh, to South Africa are prominent household name companies uh, uh, and, and, yeah very commercial there's an organization um 
who the guys will know called the Global Impact Sourcing Coalition. That's it. Um, if anyone wanted to go to their website and have a look at who their members are um, and who, you know, supports them, you know, the, the names are, you know, as you say, global household yeah. names, you know, world global leading companies. And Simon, sorry to, to jump yeah. in here, Maurizio, yeah. but where BSR actually came in, so it's Business for Social Responsibility, and they started off as the secretariat for the concept called the Global Impact Sourcing Coalition. And what was realized is that in order to um, amplify and scale the opportunity for impact sourcing was to get your buyers and create this procurement channel to, into the supply chain, which is why it works and fits so, so tidily for the BPO sector. But you have these massive global buying companies like your Microsoft, your Dells, your Facebooks, et cetera. And part of their prerequisite, well, they're, they're a member of the GISC, but they won't work with organizations as their supply chain unless they are practicing impact sourcing, which is where all our BPO third party operators come in. Um, they get involved as part of this chain. And in order to ensure that they are actually practicing impact sourcing, there's also a standard that has been developed um, through the GISC. So each of these BPO operations actually adheres to a certain standard to make sure that they are following best practice when it comes to the recruitment of, of impact workers. And that's how the procurement sort of domino effect takes place and that's how it's able to scale globally. Yeah, that's a really important point that I had thought of, Tracy, but you're right, that, that global standard that's applied throughout the industry, isn't it? Which is obviously, it provides comfort to uh, commissioning companies and things. Uh, 100%. Why is impact sourcing of its time? I mean, we were talking about it, obviously, before the pandemic came about. It felt right for the UK because we're, <laughs> we're leaving Europe, uh, so we're looking to the Commonwealth. Uh, to those countries perhaps more in the developing world, uh, which has some sort of resonance with impact sourcing. Not completely, but there's some link, linkage there. So it seemed of its time then, uh, and that was just at the end of last year. But it seems even more credible now in terms of the pandemic, not least because of business resilience. Uh, what's your view on that, Tracy? So, um the wonderful thing about impact sourcing and how it's working from a, a global perspective is that there is a CSR approach. And again, to repeat, it's not charity, but there is a CSR approach that comes into it. Um, and expanding supply chain into markets and to individuals and skill sets that otherwise wouldn't have been tapped into. Um, with regards to where we are now with the pandemic, um, interesting times and I think a lot of it will be crystal ball gazing. I think that the need now even more so is going to be around them um, touching in environments that have um, really embedded the practice of impact sourcing. Um, and what we have seen is that a couple of the countries that have been practicing impact sourcing, to your point, I mean, they actually did have the resilience to continue yes. business as usual because these individuals who'd fought so hard to get into the, the work opportunity when the pandemic hit um, and there was opportunity for them to continue working and continue servicing the customers and clients, they've done so and they've done so well at a high level of, of quality. So what we have seen from the clients that have been serviced, the international clients uh, that have been serviced from South Africa, they've been thrilled with what's come out of it. And a number of those individuals were originally impact workers or hired in from an impact sourcing perspective. Yeah, that's interesting. Maruccio, there's an opportunity to expand services further. There must be something with the pandemic and different countries experiencing it at different times. There must be some logic to having your contact centres, and, and most businesses have more than one, one or two or three, uh, having them across continents and across countries rather than having the, just relying on one country or one particular facility. Uh, does that create an opportunity for Colombia? Simon, indeed, yes, it creates because it's as as we've seen, you know, Tracy and John and I have said, is it's becoming more a practice than a, than a local type of thing doing, you know, like Colombia or South Africa or wherever. So, and, and going back to what John was saying and and what Tracy added to it's we have a practice in place which is through the Global Impact Sourcing Coalition. There's a standard, there's a, there's a, I would say, book of knowledge, if we can call it that way, that is being built. So with that said, either you can have, you know, splitted services between 
the UK and South Africa and Colombia. And at the end, it'll be a follow the zone approach that can be done by any of these big companies that have been doing work in many of the countries that we live in, you know. So these companies can put it as part of their in, uh, initiatives and part of the of, of the things that the companies would like to go for. Just to give you an example, as, as Tracy said, and, and, and part of the Global Impact Sourcing Coalition, we have these multinationals that can come and say, okay, let's split the work between, you know, these impact sourcing countries or impact sourcing opportunities via the providers that I have with me. And, and I have seen it, you know, and it's, and it's part of the companies that are being part of the Global Impact Sourcing Coalition. So at the end, I would say, and it is my personal opinion, and I hope that you agree with me, this has come and these have stayed and will stay because it's, it's improving lives. It's giving good people opportunities to improve uh, their, their families, the, the cities on which they live, which is something that we have found interesting. On these two cities, and just to move aside from the conversation, we have seen that the quality of life has improved. Mm. And just to give you an, an, an example, and, and the one in the city that I mentioned, the uh, uh, first project name is Monteria, which is on the north side of Colombia. The, uh, the employer of choice for many, many years was government which is not now. And, and people are seeing that there's no need to go, you know, and, and, and again, it's, 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 it's my personal opinion, you know, following the politician because he's going to give me work. Now I have to follow what is, what my intentions are. I'm a good girl. I'm a good boy. I have capabilities. I have capacity to do it. Let's go for it. Interesting. Yeah, thank you, thank you. John, you, you, you meet people who commission uh, BPO services, call centre, contact centre services all the time. Mm. Uh, you think impact sourcing's got a future? People will continue to look to do these sorts of deals, do you think? Uh, absolutely, you know, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, and purely because people will always want good, motivated, reliable labour. You know, that is the case. And also on the flip side, I do also think, and this is just my view, but I do also think there is a responsibility on outsourcing vendors um, who, you know, uh, certainly the bigger vendors who have kind of multiple thousands of seats in call and contact centers or BPO globally. You know, let's not forget that for a long time, the word, the, you know, the word outsourcing wasn't you know a good word to use you know people thought of outsourcing you know they thought of job losses they thought of you know um kind of companies um you know uh just sit shopping center you know where it was a, a stop gap rather than a career you know and all these things and and that's not the case you know there is a big responsibility on vendors to uh, almost give back because now we are talking less certainly within impact sourcing about you know um, taking jobs and we're talking more about job creation you know yes. this is such a big thing mm -hmm. such a big thing and I, I think it's important and it goes back to what Tracy says but I love the fact that there are certain you know multinational companies where their criteria is that they will only work with people that have a, an impact sourcing kind of a strategy in place because you know you look at the current situation you know we're, we're obviously all in lockdown but you know, there is still a need for people on the end of that phone whether it's in the financial services or the healthcare sector or or what it is um and on the flip side of that there are employable labor that, that physically can't get out of their house you know because you know, they may be disabled or looking after parents or looking after children or whatever it is. And this is globally. So mm -hmm. it's a great time to, you know, introduce that labor into your organization, tap into some really employable, skilled labor. And, and then it moves on, right? Because, you know, as Tracy said, they don't just come in at an entry level and then that's it forever. You know, these are people that are hungry to grow, they want to grow. So I do believe there's a responsibility on outsourcers to give back, for want of a better phrase. Mm. That's, that, 
Yeah, Sorry, please stress here. Yeah. No, I was just going to add on to that. I mean, globally, we've seen a shift in thinking of how organizations work. And if you look at the triple bottom line, it's obviously no longer just about profit, it's about people and planet as well. So from an ethical perspective, this fits in there really, really well. Mm -hmm. um, and in its infancy, before it had grown to the scale that it has now, um, everyone was a bit confused about, so what is this impact sourcing thing? And I used to liken it. And what I said was, where fair trade um, appeals to the, the coffee consumer, impact sourcing appeals to your employer from an ethical perspective. So it's ethical sourcing of talent, really, and skills. That's a really good description, uh, Tracy. We started trying to define it. You, towards the end, you've come up with a perfect definition, actually, which I, which I very much like. Let me, we're going to finish in a second, but let me give each of you the last word in terms of uh, ethical sourcing, perhaps we should call it. Uh, Mauricio, what, what, what's your final comments, please? Well, as, and I like what uh, Tracy came with. You know, ethical sourcing, it's giving people the opportunity of being what they deserve. And, and when I say what they deserve is, you are going to make your life. You are going to decide on your life if I have a good employer of choice because I'm going to go for it. And just to add something, it's not only youth people women of household it's humongous opportunity for them yeah. that need to work the other thing is this is something that i do like and i do love and it's something that when you when it gets into your blood you cannot take it out because you're changing lives and when you change lives that's it i mean for me my work is done Thank you, Mauricio. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for your passion. John, what's your fi final comment and thought? Um, I think, as I said, as a, a vendor, you should be looking at um, uh, impact workers. Um, again, as we've said, not because it's a charity, which it isn't, but because uh, for some cases it will be uh, an unexplored pool of labour for you. But, you know, you're going to get great workers from a, uh, a buyer of outsourcing services, I would say speak to your vendor or multi-vendors and ask them what they're doing in terms of impact sourcing. Um, ask them you know, what their policy is, um, because again, you're gonna get great workers, regardless of you know, age, country, gender, et cetera, et cetera. Great stuff. Tracy, the last word to you. Thanks for joining us, John. Thank you. Um, I would say it's a transformational practice. It's an opportunity to transform individuals' lives as well as their family and their community, and we've seen it in evidence. But it's an opportunity for an organization to transform themselves as well. Um, actually see improved service, see improved quality, and see improved uh, profits coming in because of that quality and service. So it's just transformational practice that should be adopted as a standard. Thank you very much, Tracy. Thank you to all three of you for joining me. It's been a thoroughly interesting uh, conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you, Simon, for inviting us. Thank you.